By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Oh, welcome at another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a second round match from the Raging Bull series, the old school online tournament from the Netherlands. And if you've missed round number one, check, uh, check the info card that's appearing right now. Click on it <laughs> straight away because that was an epic match with a very cool elephant graveyard build. Uh, but for now, we are going to look at a round two match that is looking very promising as well. We have the American player Jeff Watkins with a uh, blue and white control deck taking on the Italian player Francesco Delfino, who's got an interesting mono blue dolphin brew. So it's going to be really interesting to see how these two decks are holding up against each other. It promises to be a control match. Um, before I continue talking about the decks, by the way, if you want to go straight to the games, uh, you can click on the timestamp in the description below. That will take you straight to the action, straight to the games. Uh, for now, we are going to continue with the deck deck. I have nice deck pictures of both of these decks, and they're quite interesting. Let's start with the blue-white control deck from Jeff. And here we see the deck photo of Jeff Watkins. And um, the first thing I noticed with this deck is that it is pure. And with that, I mean it's just white and it's blue. It doesn't have all your usual suspects from other colors included. It doesn't have like your City of Brasses and then you go and play a Mind Twist and you go and play a Demonic Tutor and then uh, you go and play a Regrove. And you know, and before you know it, you're kind of have this, this basic deck. And I think this is really very stylish in the sense this is really a white and blue deck. This is what white and blue can do really well. And that's, I think, controlling the game. You've got your white control package, which, which of course is the four Dishon Shams, uh, the three swords to Plowsiers. And uh, then he's also playing with two Divine Offerings, so that's pretty heavy there on the uh, on the artifact removals. So that's quite interesting. He's playing with three Counter Spells, uh, two Power Sings, and Mana Drain, so he's got a pretty good uh, counter package. And on top of that, he's also playing with uh, three Psy Blasts and a Control Magic. So I think, looking at this list, I actually don't think that he'll need the Psy Blast against creatures that often, so he might just be able to direct it at the opponent to maybe finish the opponent off when they're in uh, in mid game or in late game. Um, he's, he, he doesn't have to really use his damage to deal with creatures, I think, looking at this list. Uh, another thing I noticed is that everything, almost everything I should say, is black bordered in this deck, which is really beautiful to see. Uh, we've got the lovely uh, Chaos Corp altar there with the Juzum Jin, very cool. Uh, we've got those signed mocks in there, and of course those are the four white bordered card and the, re the rest is all black bordered. Um, interesting inclusion here in this deck actually when I'm looking at it like I'm seeing a lot of things that I would kind of expect in this build but interesting here are the two land techs that Jeff is playing with. So he's he's not playing with Armageddon which you might expect when you have a land tax. Um, he's not playing for example with uh, the little book you know from the antiquities where you can discard a card and draw a card. I always kind of like that combination with land decks because you're going to have a lot of lands in your hand and then you can dump a land and, and get a card for that in return. Um, so it's interesting to see that land text and I'm curious to see if it's going to work for Jeff uh, in this matchup. Another thing that of course catches my eye is the fact that there are no dual lands in this deck. So they're just a beautiful black border basic lands there. We've got nine islands and eight planes. So that's another thing that I'm curious about. Um, is he really going to miss to dual lands and I think I think the chance is yes because of course he does have the two beautiful mocks and, and the black lotus but there are quite some spells here that require a double color casting cost you know looking at blue we've got the three counter spells and the mana drain require double blue uh, we've got control magic requires double blue and of course we've got those stunning Sarah angels require double white so yeah, of course maybe that's why he included the land text to kind of take care of that mana problem but I wonder how he's going to play out his lands and how he's going to try to activate uh, the land text. It's also interesting to see the um, IC manipulator. I'm actually expecting ICs in the blue deck as well. So this is really going to be um, could be could become a really long match, a really grindy match where you see IC manipulator battles and counter battles going on. So very curious to see. I think you know Jeff is a favorite in the sense that he has that wide control package, but he doesn't have the balance. But I mean, disenchants are extremely strong and old school magic. So I'm really wonder, wondering to see if maybe Jeff can kind of win some games just purely on that uh, white control package of Swords to Plows here as a disenchant. Okay, this is enough babbling, talking about Jeff Dex. Jeff 
Man, if you're listening to this beautiful deck, thank you for bringing it to the tournament. Now let's take a look at the deck of Francesco. And here we see the deck of Francesco Del Fino. And I mean, Francesco is a great player. He's a former champion of the Fish Liver Oil Cup in Italy. That's a huge old school magic tournament. So if you can win that, you can play cards. And um, if you look at this deck, again, stunning, just like Jeff's deck. This deck completely black bordered. Um, it's just amazing what kind of cards you see are in these collections of these players. And the first thing that I actually notice here is the Cyclopean Tomb. And Cyclopean Tomb, uh, for the people that don't know, it's an artifact and it, you can actually tap it. I think you have to pay two. Yeah, you pay two and tap it and you turn any one non-swamp land into a swamp during the upkeep. And then you have to mark the change land with tokens. And here is where I think it gets really interesting and exotic. If Cyclopean Tomb is destroyed, you can only remove one token of your choice each upkeep, returning that land to its original nature. So in other words, um, if Jeff would uh, disenchant Cyclopean Tomb after a few turns, it doesn't mean that all his lands are turning back into their original state. No, it's going to take a long time. So I'm curious to see how Cyclopean Tomb is going to perform. It's definitely an interesting include in this mono blue deck. Um, then we also see the inclusion of a city in a bottle main and of course that means that he's not playing with surrender Perfrites. instead he's chosen to play with two ghost ships and four air elementals so I kind of recognize that uh, that, that tactical decision here and also we see four Cyblast and Cyblast of course kind of an auto include for counter spells also auto, auto include I guess mana drain as well then we see an interesting card, Hercules Recall, just under the Ancestral Recall. Hercules Recall, instant for blue and one from the Antiquities Collection. It says return all artifacts uh, of, of target owner to their hands. Um, so that means you can pick yourself, but you can also pick your opponent. And what I like about those cards is they're diverse. So you can see, do I want to use them offensively, defensively? Do, do I want to use them on myself right now to, for example, make sure that an artifact doesn't get destroyed by a disenchant uh, or maybe an Evanero's Disc Effect? Or do I want to use it on my opponent uh, to make sure that his hand is full? I can see uh, some black vices there, for example, in the sideboard of Francesco. So it's it's always interesting. It's a card, very flexible card. You can do a lot with it. I'm personally a big fan of those cards. And then um, if we look at the third row of his deck picture, we see a stunning steel artifact. Now, steel artifact is a card that um, I've been trying to build around, or not build around, but I've been trying to include it in my builds. Um, and I haven't been very successful, to be honest. Every time when I when I... When I have it in my hand, there's just nothing to steal, or there's a Triskelion on the field. Why would you, you know, if you steal a Triskelion, the, the, the opponent will take off the counters. The dream, of course, at least my dream of Steel Artifact is when you play against like a Troll Disco deck, for example, and they play enough Neural's Disc, comes into play tap, that I didn't steal that enough Neural's Disc, and I have it uh, for my own advantage. But in reality, Steel Artifact hasn't really done it for me. So I'm really curious to see if Francesco. Um, can use it in his advantage and to see kind of how it's going to perform, just like with the Cyclopean Tomb, actually. Um, so that's kind of his main. If, if I look at the sideboard, what I notice is the Stasis. So Stasis, very interesting inclusion here, and of course also two Time Elemental. So I can see that Stasis, Time Elemental thing, it's, it's a very old-fashioned combo, usually too slow to actually really make it work. But who knows, maybe Francesco has cracked the code on that. And um, I, I am curious, though, why he put a Stasis in the sideboard for what kind of decks that he's hoping to actually use the stasis. Like, for example, I can understand that the Ivory Towers are really a great weapon, for example, against Underworld Dreams or Black Vices. You know, so, so I can kind of understand that choice. But for me, the stasis is a little bit of a mystery. So if somebody has an idea why that's in that sideboard, let me know. And I do understand this Mono Blue, so he's got a lot of islands in there. I, I, do, I do get that part, uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, for the rest, maybe he's expecting a certain deck type. I'm 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 curious when I'm when I'm seeing this list I'm curious why is there a stasis it's it's kind of puzzling so if if you have an idea let me know in the comments below um, this is it this is the deck deck we've seen both of these decks amazing decks so uh, let's check out how it's going to um, how it's going to end up here between Jeff and Francesco let's go to game one game number one let's get it on we've got the uh, white blue control player Jeff from the state sitting on the left side. With that Burning Mountain Juggernaut's playmat, looking pretty cool. I'm sure that's from some kind of tournament. And we see uh, Francesco with his Fish Liver Oil playmat, also very stylish on the right side. Looks like they're both just starting out with some basics. Um, Jeff passing tourney and step, probably that Ancestral Recall from Francesco there. And taking on his second turn now. 
And let's see, is he going to play something or will he just discard a lot of cards? I guess he's going to play something. Second blue, playing a Mox Pearl as well. And with the two blue, he can counter. And he's choosing not to. He's actually going playing a City in a Bottle. And there is a Divine Offering on the Mox Pearl. And I guess this is already information for uh, Francesco that um, Jeff doesn't really mind the City in a Bottle. And there we see a um, Icy Manipulator. And of course, in his upkeep, Jeff is tapping the basic island of Francesco. Francesco playing another one passing turn here. That means that he's got the two blue open again to do some counter magic. Also two blue now from Jeff. Interesting choice here that he's not keeping his uh, blue mana open. I guess maybe he has a disenchant or something. Anyway, he's going to tap down one of the islands again. And uh, let's see what Francesco can do. So he took some damage there from the Mistress Factory. So Francesco dropped to 18 here. There's a strip mine on the planes. So kind of taking out one of the colors, choosing not to go for the Mistress Factory. I think that's, uh, that's a wise decision, actually. Attacking with the 2-2, two -two, being able to pump him for 3-3 uh, with the other Mistress Factory. So I believe Francesco is now dropping to 15. It's hard to see that life count there. So he's dropped to 15, pumping 2-2, two -two, attacking again. And that would mean he's going to drop to 12 here. But there is a Psy Blast. So that mean, means he is going to drop, but not to 12, but to 13. And of course, the Mishra's Factory is gone. And we haven't seen too much from Francesco. And I wanted to say, will there be a ghost ship? But actually, it's not a ghost ship. It's a Cyclopean tomb that we, uh, we talked about in the deck deck. So really curious to see this card perform attacking again. I believe Francesco is now on 11. And I'm using the Cyclopean Tomb in the upkeep to turn the Mishra's Factory into a swamp. So this is pretty cool. What you can do, you can pay two. You can only do it during your upkeep. And you can tap the Cyclopean Tomb to turn target land into a swamp. And um, it's, it's, it's a great weapon in this case against that Mishra's Factory because uh, both of them were doing a lot of damage to Francesco. And it looks like Jeff is a little bit stuck on land here. And now um, he's getting into, in, into trouble because of this uh, Cyclopean Tomb. So look at that card doing some serious work. And uh, in response, Jeff is uh, casting a uh, side Blast here. And then I believe, ooh, there's a Mana Drain here from Francesco. What I wanted to say is I believe he's going to drop to 9. But because of that Counterspell... He is still on, uh, on 13. And of course, he's going to get that extra mana from the mana drain. Uh, now remember, in uh, Swedish old school magic, uh, you don't get any mana burn. So that makes mana drain a little bit better in Swedish old school. And there's a disenchant, it seems, uh, probably on the Cyclopean Tomb. And now remember, uh, his lance will turn back only during his upkeep, so it's going to take forever. And is he going to flip here on the Icy Manipulator? Oh, it's a miss, actually. Ay, 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 that's heavy. And what's going to happen now? Every upkeep, um, uh, Jeff gets to take off one of his counters from his lance, turning them back in their original state. So actually what he's doing right now is yeah is is wrong so he can just change one land and i guess it's in the upkeep of francesco now this is so nice about these cards like cyclopean tomb you don't see them often so it's always a new experience when when i when i see them in play at least there's a beautiful ghost ship here by francesco but they quick sorts to plows here is on the ghost ship that does mean two more life for francesco so he's climbing slowly back up and i believe he's at 15 now and uh, that uh, that um, Icy Manipulator is still doing work here, tapping on one of the islands. And there is the uh, JM Day Tome from Francesco. That means he can start drawing some cards pretty soon, but he is stepped out at the moment, so unable to counter anything. So curious to see, maybe Jeff can find a second planes and maybe cast like Sarah Angel or something. And uh, this is nice. They were actually trying to explain. Francesco was using his best English to explain to Jeff uh, how the Cyclopean Tomb works. And uh, yeah, I, they're probably still talking about how that card works. But anyway, um, to make a long story short, 
every upkeep, one of the lands is going to turn back. And there's that second planes. Will there be, oh, there's a disenchant probably on the book, exactly on the book. And I think that's very important here from, uh, from Jeff. Because card advantage is a real thing and it can win you games. So that book had to go. So that's a good move by Jeff here. Let's see what Francesco can do. And there is a maze of if. And so far the game is very much kind of what I expected in terms of control. You know, both players are really responding to each other. And there we see a tap of five. We see a Sarah Angel. Yes, there she is. The beautiful Sarah Angel hitting the board here by Jeff. But there's a counter spell from Francesco. And, uh, you know, obviously he knows um, that uh, Jeff has that icy manipulator to tap down the, uh, the maze of if. So that maze is no guarantee. Look at that. Cracking the Lotus for a Brain Geyser of three. Keeping two mana open probably to counter. And that, that means that if we also think of the Ancestral Recall that Francesco casted earlier in the game, he already has a card advantage of six, so that's quite a lot. And there we see a second Icy Manipulator, but a counterspell here from Francesco. I think that's very important because Icy's are incredibly difficult to deal with. We don't see a counterspell back here from Jeff. He does have those two blue mana open. So does it mean that he doesn't have a counter spell or does it mean that he doesn't find it important enough to protect his Icy Manipulator? There is an Ivory Tower. Now this is always difficult. And there we do see a counter spell, a Mana Drain. And that's probably because Francesco is still reasonably low. So Jeff doesn't want to see him go up and kind of get his life total all out of range. And uh, he's going to do it and he's going to attack again, I guess with the Mistress Factory, but there is a Psy Blast here from Francesco. Does mean that he takes two. So I believe he's then on 13 again. Playing a Mox and another book and still keeping two blue mana open. And is that a Power Sink? Yes, sir, that's a Power Sink, but a Counterspell on the Power Sink. This could be decisive here with Francesco having that book, being able to draw more cards now. And we see that Jeff is almost empty. And Francesco still has two cards in hand. So he's got one card extra and he's got the book. Now drawing an extra card with the book. So he's going to four cards in hand in total, playing that Mox Jet. And of course, here we see kind of that card advantage working out for Francesco, you know, casting the Ancestral Recall and playing that Brain Geyser gave him a lot of advantage. But now we see a land tax as well. And I'm just counting the lands. Jeff has seven lands. Francesco actually has also seven lands. So no, eight lands with the Maze of If. So that means that next turn, Jeff can actually activate the land tax. I do wonder if they'll notice it though, because it happens often that players kind of forget that Mesa Viv is also a land. No, they don't. Okay, that's good. That's good magic here, Jeff. So he's finding his land, showing it here, three basic islands, putting it in hand. And uh, I think, you know, at least his land tax is, is, is showing some light at the end of the tunnel here for Jeff. And there is a strip mine. Is he taking care of that Mesa Viv? Yes, he is. I have to say, I find this a little of an interesting choice. I think I would have kept the strip on in hand, kept the lance on hand, and just take out even more lands with the land tax. But there we see a Mistress Factory from Francesco, again drawing extra cards with that book. And because of that Mishra, um, Jeff can once again dig for lands. And, and of course, you know, lands is not going to help him here, but it does mean that his chances of, of drawing something useful uh, increase, you know, if you take out all your basic lands, then the chances of you finding something useful really, really increase. And that's, of course, what it's all about here for uh, for Jeff. Understandable using the icing now to tap down the Mishra's factory, making sure he doesn't take any damage. And I actually think that Jeff hasn't taken any damage so far. There we see a Library of Alexandria, not very relevant at the moment, with only one card for Francesco. And we see a beautiful Air Elemental. And a quick response here, a sword to Plausiers. And I believe that means that uh, Francesco is going to go back up to 17. So both of these players still have huge life totals. So there is a lot happening, but there's also not really anything happening because both players still have a lot of life. 
I believe Jeff is on 20 and Francesco right now is, I mean, he's like on 17, I think. There's an island by Jeff discarding an island. And oh, of course, Aloha couldn't be played because of the city in a bottle. I missed that as well. And uh, I think they corrected it here. It's an honest mistake. Again, a mistake that's made often um, by me included. And there we see a transmute artifact. Probably want to sack the city in a bottle, but in response, there is a power sink here by Jeff. I think that's quite important, this power sink. And I think he has to tap down his lands right now. He does, exactly. So he's completely tapped out. And I think this power sink, again, is very important. And an Ancestral Recall now by Jeff. So is he coming back into the game here? Remember, he doesn't have a lot of basics in, in his library anymore. So he probably found useful spells. Maybe another Sarah. There's a Suchi to bring on some pressure here. And uh, it's really nice to see that Icy. I mean, it's been here since, uh, since the start of the game. When I play Icy's, my opponent always get, get, gets rid of them quite quickly. So I'm not really used to seeing an Icy so far. Oh, Control Magic. But there's a Counterspell. Will there be a Counter Counterspell from Francesco? No, there will not be. Wow. So that, that Control Magic was important. But there's a good Counterspell. Oh, and there we see a Cyblast. There we see a Cyblast. And that's why, for example, a card like Urn and Jin is so strong because it has five toughness. There we see a side blast. So that means uh, the Suchi is gone as well. So we're kind of stuck still in this control matchup. There's another Suchi by Jeff here. And another one. So he's got two Suchis. He's ready to rock and roll. And he's got two blue open to counter, possibly to protect them. But of course, Francesco still has that book. So I'm sure when you're Jeff, you're really annoyed looking at that book. And he keeps drawing cards from that book. Tapping, it looks like tapping a lot of mana here. Is he going to play another creature? Let's see what he's going to... Oh, playing a recall. And that means he can get back his ancestral recall. He can get back a counterspell. He can get back a control magic. He can... Let's see what he's going to pick. He's, he's choosing control magic here. What else? He's got to pick ancestral, right? Of course, ancestral recall. And uh, wow, what a great turn here for... Francesco, and maybe this is a game changer actually. There's no counter spell from Jeff. There is a control magic here taking over to Suchi. That means both players have a Suchi right now. And is Jeff finding something? A control magic, so he's. <laughs> so, counter spell. Counter spell. It looks like. I mean, I think when I'm looking at this game, it looks like Francesco just has counter spells all the time when he needs them. It is interesting to see here, uh, you know, it, it, it was almost control magic on control magic. And uh, there was four damage, by the way, dealt by Jeff. So I think that means that Francesco is on 13 again. And he's actually swinging in for six here. So that means I think he's dropping. Okay, he's dropping to 13. We can actually see the dice there. So he's dropping to 13 there for Jeff. And uh, to my knowledge, Francesco is on 13 right now, but I, I could be absolutely wrong because it's hard to follow. There's an air element now being cast by Francesco, so he's he's bringing up the heat. But Jeff is just going to keep swinging in, and that means that Francesco's going to drop to 9. But next turn, I mean, Jeff is going to take a lot of damage. Maybe he has a side blast in hand. He's now on 13, and, you know, ideally, Francesco can actually deal 10 damage now, because he also has that, oh no, even 12 damage, because he has two Mishra's Factories. So curious to see what he's going to do. Playing a Time Walk, I think this is, this is, this is the first game then. Okay, we see a Side Blast being cast. Is there another counter spell from... Francesco, no, there's not. So he's losing the air elemental. That means that Jeff is taking two more damage, going to 11. And that's it. He's saying this is game. This is it. Because remember, he, he, uh, Francesco casted that time walk so he could hit him for eight, take extra turn, hit him for eight again. So um, time walk kind of gave Francesco the game. And that's kind of nice. That's kind of like the old school way of how time walk used to be played. Nowadays, you see time walk being used way more aggressively. 
Um, anyway, very interesting game. And this was just the first game. Man. So let's let these players sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. And uh, players are still shuffling up here. Round number two of the Raging Bull series. And uh, we see the American player Jeff on the left with his uh, blue and white control deck against Francesco Delfino with his mono blue Dolphin Brew. And he won that first game. So that means that uh, Jeff will have to try to win this one to uh, go to a game number three. And there we see Francesco starting here with a black vice. Doesn't look that strong actually because uh, Jeff had the turn one soul ring. So that means he only takes uh, one damage here, dropping to 19. And I'm putting that dice on his land to kind of keep track of that uh, upkeep trigger, trigger of Black Vice. And this is actually pretty nice. We see a uh, Suchi by Jeff. Let's see if Francesco can do anything against it. Just playing a second blue, no damage here for Jeff. And he's probably going to swing in here for four. Playing another uh, planes, he, he's not finding any uh, any islands at the moment. So basic planes, passing turn, and there is a Mishra's factory, and passing turn again. So probably he's going to swing in for four again, and that means Francesco is going to go to twelve. I mean, he can, he can block, I guess. And, of course, he now has enough mana to play his side blast as well. Asking about the card count. And uh, Black Fly is actually a great weapon against a Library of Alexandria. And I guess uh, Francesco boarded it, it in because he saw that land tax. So it's also a great weapon against land tax. The Black Vice coming from the sideboard here. And there's a Control Magic. Taking over the Suchi, and of course, Jeff doesn't have any mana to counter because he doesn't have blue available, but he does have Disenchant, of course, in the color white. So we see a Suchi here by Francesco on that control magic. It's actually still tapped, but it doesn't really matter for the current situation. Jeff is just passing turn here. That means that uh, Francesco can untap, and he can now he can deal eight damage, or actually try to if he wants to. Another uh, Mishra's Factory. Is he going to just play aggressively? No, he's not. He wants to keep his two blue open. Attacking you for six. Poss possibility to pump it to seven. And there we see a Swords to Plowsiers. And is he playing that on his own Suchi? Yes, he is. So that means Francesco is going to gain uh, four life, actually. And three damage here for Jeff. So Jeff's going to drop to 16. And uh, he's going to take turn. No burn from the uh, Black Vice. There's an island. So Jeff has found blue land. Can he do anything with that blue land? That's the question. I think usually when you're playing blue, you want to have two blue islands and not just one. But, I mean, he is playing with Power Sinks, so it's definitely something that Francesco will keep in the back of his mind when casting anything. He's just attacking now uh, with both. Again, keeping two blue open to possibly protect it from Disenchance. Swinging in for four here. That would mean Jeff would drop down to 12 with the possible pump, dealing five damage in total. There we see a Psionic Blast. Will we see a Counter Spell? And uh, he's actually now pumping the other one. So I guess he, he didn't pump it yet. So Jeff eventually dropping here to 12 after also taking damage from the side blast. Now let's see. Finding a second island. So, I mean, he's got counter capability now. Problem is he's already on 12, which is quite low. And uh, Francesco can hit him now. It's going to drop to eight. He really just needs some more removal or he needs just a Sarah Angel or something. Just something big and beefy here to stop those Mishra's factories or just Disenchant will do the trick as well. And of course, the, the, this is also a problem with Psionic Blast. I mean, if he's drawing in Psy Blasts, the lower he gets, 
Ooh, interesting there. We see a time twister, but we see a mana drain. It actually took a while for me to realize it was a time twister with the glare on the card, but wow, that could could have been a huge game changer. But we saw the counter spell from Francesco. And I, I think that could have brought Jeff back in the game if that time twister would have uh, resolved there, but it just didn't happen. There was that mana drain there. We see an air elemental here. Of course, using the extra mana from the mana drain to cast it, only needing two blue extra. So playing that beautiful air elemental and then swinging in for four, that means Jeff will drop to four life. And, and that's basically what I just wanted to say earlier. If, if he draws into a Psyblast now, I mean, he can't really use it anymore because he's, he's so low on life. And is this it? I mean, he needs... I think Control Magic would be the best. Control Magic on Air Elemental? Yes! Perfect. And Francesco not being able to counter after already having to counter that, uh, that Time Twister. And this is actually pretty nice and interesting. That means uh, he's got a 4-4 blocker now. And are we going tapping for... Oh! Control Magic in the Control Magic Air Elemental back. Will we see a disenchant here from Jeff? No! Another Control Magic and a Counterspell. But Jeff doesn't have that second blue source to cast the Counterspell. Oh! Oh man. Okay. Well, we I mean, we talked a little bit during the 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 deck tech video when we looked at Jeff's deck and I said, you know, I'm curious to see um how his deck will perform without the dual lands. Um and I think we've seen now why dual lands are, are are so important. Um I I do think that uh I do like it, you know, playing basic lands it's cool, but ah oh, man, you just need those two blue to play your counterspell. And uh, hey, congratulations to Francesco winning here in the second round. So it's another 0-2, this time for Francesco from Italy. And um, thank you all for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you like this, if you like tournament magic like this, let me know in the comments uh, below. You know, give me some feedback. And uh, also, if you want to support the channel, uh, um, Leaving a comment really helps. Leaving a like, subscribing to the channel if you're not the sub yet. And you can also support Timmy Talks on Patreon so you can support us financially. Help us grow. Uh, there's a, um, a little card popping up right now. You can click on there and that'll take you to the Patreon page. And you can check out how you can support Timmy Talks. Talking about Patreon, let's go to the end scroll. Let's look at the beautiful, fantastic, gorgeous, handsome, talented patrons of Timmy Talks. Ik het dus, ik het dus, somba kazee!